Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. Mondays have never been my favorite day of the week. Today's shaping up to be one of the roughest ones yet. My wife Peggy seemed unusually downcast and gloomy. She went through the motions of fixing breakfast for me and the boys, but it was like she was on autopilot. She wasn't being mean or anything, just really down in the dumps. It didn't exactly set a cheerful tone for the morning. I couldn't figure out what was bothering her, and honestly, I didn't feel like probing. My sons, Robert, who's 16, and Dave, who's 18, headed off to school around the same time I left for work. For the past 15 years, I've been working at a freight company where I load and unload container ships. The job can be demanding, but the compensation makes it worthwhile. Since I can remember, I've harbored a deep-seated desire to explore the vast expanse of the sea and discover distant shores. It's a passion that ignites a fire within me, although there are moments when the realization that it may remain unfulfilled weighs heavily on my heart. Nevertheless, family always takes precedence. I find solace and joy in my domestic life, blessed with two incredible sons and a wife whose love I cherish dearly. Yet, there's no denying the gloom that Monday brings, heralding the start of another workweek. The most arduous aspect of my job, dealing with certain colleagues, particularly Colin Farrell and his companions, Bob Timbers, Ray Collins, and Freddie Springer. Our acquaintance dates back to high school, but their antics never appealed to me then, and they still don't now. Colin wasted no time trying to stir up trouble today, mentioning a party on Saturday night that I missed, because I was helping my father move out of his house in Chester. My mom passed away six months ago, so my dad decided to downsize. I encouraged Peggy to go to the party without us, but when she got back, she just said it was okay. I shot Colin a glare and stayed silent. Sorry you couldn't join us, Grady, but thanks for sending your wife. She really livened up the party. He smirked. My fists clenched as I heard his group cackling like a bunch of hyenas, seemingly enjoying some private joke at my expense. As I began to walk away, Colin trailed behind, continuing his mocking. Your wife's turned into quite a looker since high school, Grady. You're a lucky man to have her waiting for you at home every night, he jeered. I knew it was going to be a rough day. My forehead veins bulged and the muscles in my neck tightened. Throughout my life, I'd struggled to keep my temper in check. Trying to avoid confrontation, I turned away again. But Colin wasn't done. He tossed something my way. Red, soft, a pair of panties. Peggy left these behind on Saturday. She might need them to match that red bra she had on. He snickered, prompting laughter from the group. I stood there, refusing to pick up the red silk that had fallen to the ground. I realized I'd stopped breathing, feeling my stomach muscles tense up. I was a tightly wound spring of rage about to snap. I knew I could take on any one of them, but facing all of them at once seemed daunting. At that moment, I didn't care. I started moving toward them, ready to confront them, when a large hand grabbed my shoulder. Josh Hamilton, the foreman, met my gaze and wordlessly gestured toward the main office. I shot a fierce glare at the group, a hatred burning inside me, and followed Josh up the stairs. Suddenly their laughter ceased, replaced by worried expressions. Inside Henry Clark's office, I took a seat opposite his secretary, Sally. No thanks, I'm too upset to hold a cup right now, I replied. Through the glass partition I could see Josh and Henry engaged in a serious discussion. Sally, were you at the party on Saturday night? I inquired. She simply nodded in affirmation. Can you tell me what happened? I'm completely clueless and Peggy hasn't said a word. I pressed. Sally hesitated, reluctant to speak. Grady, I really shouldn't get involved. This is something you should discuss with your wife. She evaded. But Sally, you were present. You saw it all. Can't you at least give me a clue? I implored, desperation lacing my words. Sally fidgeted with some papers on her desk, clearly uncomfortable with the topic. Please, Sally, I need to understand, I pressed on. Reluctantly, Sally relented. Well, Peggy arrived at the party looking absolutely stunning. However, after about an hour, Colin started pushing drinks her way. She began to recount. She seemed to be enjoying herself. Colin would share a joke with his buddies every time he brought more drinks, and they would all burst into laughter. Sally paused. Hesitating before continuing, eventually, Peggy and Colin disappeared into the back store room. About 30 minutes later, Bob, Ray and Freddie followed them. We didn't see any of them for an hour, and then they all returned, laughing and joking. Peggy had a smile on her face but she looked disheveled. Her hair was a mess and her dress was wrinkled. About 10 minutes later, Peggy and Colin left together. Thanks, Sally. I didn't want to hear that but it makes sense, I said. We sat in silence for another 10 minutes. Josh came out and gestured for me to come in. Grady, I'm not pleased with what happened this morning, he began. Colin, Ray, Bob and Freddie each received a week off without pay. I'm giving you two weeks of vacation. 
I heard about what happened on Sai, and I assume this is news to you. I can't risk anyone getting hurt. I don't blame you for any of this, but I expect you to sort things out before returning. I'll do whatever I can to support you through this. Now get out of here, he concluded. I nodded a thanks to Henry and Sally as I exited the office. Colin and his crew were nowhere to be seen as I headed to the parking area. I left the panties on the dock and decided not to go home. Instead I drove north, searching for a place where I could find solace. It gave me plenty of time to reflect on the past and the present. Peggy and I were classmates in high school. She was large, overweight and messy, not exactly conventionally attractive. She lacked grooming skills and didn't know how to apply makeup. Her hair was always a mess, and she didn't fit in with any of the popular groups, making her somewhat of a social outcast. Ironically, that's what drew me to her. I was a big guy, towering at 6'3 and weighing close to 300 pounds. I was also awkward, shy and not particularly good-looking. Sports weren't my thing due to my clumsiness. Colin Farrell, on the other hand, was the opposite. He was handsome, charismatic and athletic. There were rumors that girls wanted Colin to be their first experience. Despite not having a steady girlfriend, he always had a date. I couldn't stand him. He'd boast about his conquests, and the girls seemed impressed. Then there was Peggy. She'd hoped Colin would take her out, wanting to claim him as her first. However, Colin not only rejected her, but publicly humiliated her by telling everyone about it, calling her derogatory names. The school found it amusing. But Peggy was devastated. I saw this as my opportunity to step in. Since I wasn't familiar with the dating game, I decided to just be friendly with Peggy. Before long, we grew close, and by the time high school ended, we were a couple. After school, I landed a job in construction. Within a year, I shed my excess weight and became muscular and fit. It felt great not to be a laughingstock anymore. Peggy and I tied the knot within a year. Our sons, Robert and Dave, came soon after, and Peggy started hitting the gym. Her transformation was incredible. She learned how to style her hair, put on makeup just right, and dress to impress. She looked amazing, and I was proud to call her my wife. I loved her before her makeover, and now she was like a princess. When I got the job at the loading dock, our lives took a turn for the better until today. As I drove down the A1 highway, I knew exactly where I was headed. It was just a matter of time. I couldn't help but think about our two sons. They came from sturdy stock and showed it. We made sure they stayed active to avoid turning into couch potatoes like we once were. Dave was a bit taller and leaner, while Robert had big hands and muscular arms. Both were in good shape and capable of looking after themselves. We taught them the importance of self-control and not being bullies. Both of them shared the same dream of sailing the seas. I suppose it ran in the family. I made a promise to support them in whatever they wanted to pursue. Peggy was a fantastic mother and a wonderful wife. She managed the household well and avoided spending money on unnecessary things. Our intimate life was satisfying, or so I thought. We enjoyed ourselves during our intimate moments and I was content with that aspect of our relationship. I found myself driving on the M6, still covering the miles. The shadows were growing longer and I hoped to reach my destination before nightfall. It was a seven-hour journey to Port Patrick, but it was the only place I wanted to be at that moment. I kept an eye out for the A-75 and finally spotted it as the sun dipped below the horizon. There were plenty of parking spots available this time of year near the Duke's Inn. I handed my keys to the bartender and requested a room for the week. I had no luggage, change of clothes or razor, but I didn't mind. He retrieved the room key from the rack, handed it to me and hung my car keys in the same place. I grabbed a pint and settled into the back corner. The amber light from the street lamp filtered through the bottle glass window beside me. It was time to numb myself and forget about the world. Frequently, I'd awaken in my room well into the morning, my recollection of how I got there fuzzy at best. Often, a local would assist me up the stairs and deposit me onto the bed, but I seldom bothered with the sheets. A splash of water on my face and the occasional shower did little to alleviate my discomfort, especially since I had to don the same clothes afterward. Observing my rapidly growing beard, a sight unfamiliar to me, added to my disquiet. Periodically, they'd swipe my credit card to settle my tab, as I wallowed in self-pity, increasingly weary of my own state. Lost in contemplation, I found myself gazing at the dartboard yet again, when two police officers entered the room. I observed them without really looking at them. They chatted with the bartender for a bit, and he gestured toward me. He also pointed to where my keys hung on the wall behind him. I figured they were looking for me. I was impressed by my own deduction. They didn't bother trying to engage me in conversation. Instead, they just kept refilling my coffee for the next couple of hours. Grady, Grady Baxter, can we have a word with you? Did I do something wrong? I asked. We just need to talk. Are you up for it? 
Shall we step outside? The sun was shining, but everything was damp. The cobblestones on the street and the floor of the pub were slippery, so I took my time walking across to the seawall. The whole street was on a slope, and I still felt a bit unsteady. The fresh air felt wonderful as I breathed it in. I didn't smoke, but the air inside was so heavy, it felt like I did. I leaned over the granite seawall and vomited. It was mostly liquid since I hadn't eaten much solid food in the last few days. My head started to clear, and so did my vision. My two companions waited patiently as I composed myself. I started to feel guilty for causing them so much trouble. The bench I sat on was wet, but I didn't mind. So, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I asked. Firstly, we've been trying to locate you since you've been missing for 10 days. Secondly, we've been trying to track down Colin Farrell, and we were hoping you could assist us, they explained. Well, you've found me, so that part is resolved. As for Colin Farrell, I haven't seen him since the day I arrived here. The bartender probably already told you that I haven't budged since I checked in. I don't know where Colin is, but I'll probably go looking for him when I get back home. I talked to them for another hour. They didn't have anything to charge me with, and once they found me safe, they seemed more interested in talking about Colin. They tracked me down through the credit card charges. I'll remember not to make that mistake again, if it ever comes up. I went downhill and bought some fresh clothes and a toothbrush. I decided to keep the beard for a while even though it looked terrible. After a final shower, I settled my bill and headed home. I stopped about four times on the way. I grabbed a bite to eat twice, but mostly, I was just trying to delay getting home. There was nothing pleasant or enjoyable waiting for me there, but I did want to see my boys. She was sitting on the couch. Only one light was on in the living room. She watched me, her hands in her lap. Afraid to move, it seemed like she'd been crying, but it was hard to tell in the dim light. I wanted a beer, but the thought of it made me a little queasy, so I grabbed a soda instead. I settled into the recliner across from her, waiting for her to speak up. The boys are spending the night at their friend's place. I suggested it so we could have some time alone to chat. Why didn't you tell me before I found out? I don't know. I guess I was scared. Scared of what? I wasn't sure how you'd react or what you'd do. I did something foolish, and it didn't turn out well. Didn't turn out well. What do you mean? You won't get mad, will you, Grady? I'm not sure. It's probably best if you tell the truth, but let's see. Grady, remember what Colin did to me in high school? Yeah, I've wanted to get back at him for that since it happened. Saturday night at the party, I thought it was the right moment, so I set a trap for him. That's not what I heard. Hear me out, Grady. Like I said, it didn't go as planned. I dressed up nicely, and Colin started flirting with me. I let him think he was getting somewhere and he suggested we go to the storeroom. We kissed a bit because I had to play along to set him up. After a while, he was touching my chest over my bra, so I slipped off my panties and teased him with them to make sure he was aroused. Why did you do that? What were you thinking? I wanted to get back at him. I wanted him to pay for embarrassing me. Anyway, I noticed he was excited, so I told him to take off his pants so we could have some fun. He did and then I did something girls are never supposed to do. All right, what on earth did you do? I pointed at his stiff member and burst into laughter. I told him it was a sorry excuse for a manhood and that I wouldn't let anyone with such a tiny thing like that touch me. As I mocked him about his size it started to shrink until it was completely limp. It was a mean thing to do but it felt right in that moment. Keep going. I composed myself and headed for the door to leave. Bob, Ray, and Freddy were waiting outside. Apparently Colin had told them they could have a turn after him, and they were patiently waiting. I walked past them and went to the restroom laughing. When I returned to the party, they were all standing around with smug grins on their faces. Apparently, they had spread the rumor to everyone at the party that they had been with me in the storeroom. They claimed it was payback for me humiliating Colin. I was upset and left. I heard you left with Colin. That's not true. I left alone and drove straight home. You left your underwear there for Colin. No, I just forgot them when I left. Why didn't you tell me? I questioned. Frustration evident in my voice. After they twisted everything, I got scared. I didn't know how to explain it to you, I confessed, feeling a pang of guilt. So, you let me find out on my own in front of all my co-workers. I felt like a fool, like I was being cheated on, I lamented, the memory still fresh in my mind. They teased me about what happened, and I couldn't even respond because I didn't know the truth. I had to learn from a secretary, and her version doesn't match yours exactly. She wasn't there. I was. What I told you is what happened. Darn it, Grady. I'm your wife. You were supposed to defend me and stand by me, Peggy exclaimed. Her voice tinged with hurt as she retreated into the kitchen, tears streaming down her cheeks. I remained seated, my soda untouched, observing her as she leaned on the formica table, her sobs echoing softly in the room. 
Despite the turmoil, my love for her remained unwavering. She was the only woman I ever truly cared for, and despite her tears and accusations, I knew Peggy had a plan to salvage our marriage. Sally had no reason to lie to me. I felt the urge to start questioning the whole idea of marriage. Sally had no reason to lie to me. I felt like I wanted to grill Peggy on every inconsistency in her story, but I chose not to. I couldn't change what had happened, and pushing Peggy to confess something she didn't want to wouldn't help. I did want to know the truth, but I wasn't going to get it from her. I decided to leave things as they were and let her relax. I took another shower and got into bed with my wife. She rested her head on my shoulder, whispered that she loved me, and we both drifted off to sleep. I still had a few days off before going back to work. The boys were happy to see me, but kept their distance a bit. I suggested a trip to London, which they quickly agreed to. Peggy seemed pleased that the men in her family were bonding. During the drive to London, I learned that the boys had both been suspended for fighting, something we strongly disapproved of in our family. They reluctantly explained that they were getting teased about their mother's antics at the party, and decided to put a stop to it. Some boys with big mouths ended up with bloody noses and black eyes. They kept the suspension from their mother but asked me about what happened at the party. I postponed the conversation. We went to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, and I requested three applications. The boys were thrilled. It took an hour to complete all the paperwork. I had all the necessary documents, like birth records and passports. After each of us had a brief interview, they handed us medical forms to be filled out by a doctor. We went to Wagamama for dinner, and then headed home. We agreed not to say anything to their mother or friends. The physical exams were done the next day, and now all we had to do was wait. I always loved Peggy. She was the only girl I ever loved, kissed, or had closeness with. It was hard for me to believe she could do something so low. I found her actions disgraceful and unforgivable. I was still open to giving her a chance if she could somehow prove her story. But the chances seemed slim. By the end of the week, she made things worse. Peggy had been very attentive, careful not to mention anything about the party or my trip to Port Patrick. She was trying hard to get our life back on track. The next morning at breakfast, she dropped a bombshell. Grady, I've been thinking I want to have another baby. Now let's put this in context. Peggy had been on birth control pills for years after the boys were born. About three years ago, she stopped taking them due to side effects. I won't go into details, but she had health issues related to the pills. We weren't using any other form of birth control. Shortly after, I visited the doctor for a shoulder issue. During the appointment, I asked about getting a vasectomy, and in just 20 minutes, I was sterile. I didn't tell Peggy about it. I didn't see a reason to. For the past three years, Peggy and I have been having unprotected contact without birth control, and she never questioned why she wasn't getting pregnant. Now suddenly, she wants to have a baby as if by magic. Either she's incredibly naive, or she thinks I am. I was surprised by her suggestion, but I played along. As a man, I'm not an expert on pregnancy, but since it had been almost three weeks since the party, Peggy might have missed her period and was trying to cover it up. This made me rethink things, so I decided to change my plans. The boys were at school, and I talked to them before they left. They seemed to understand the situation with their mother better than I did. Having their support made me feel better, even though I wasn't sure what would happen next. I spent most of the day searching for Colin Farrell. He had to be somewhere. During lunch I spoke to Sally at the docks but she had no information about Colin. There was a rumor that he feared I'd seek revenge. It didn't add up because I was usually peaceful. I steered clear of where they worked to avoid bumping into my three tormentors. I visited a local lawyer to begin the divorce paperwork with Peggy. I didn't want to hurt her, but I couldn't continue living with her. With the boys soon to be on their own, I saw no reason to stay. One issue I couldn't shake was the urge to thank Colin and his friends for ruining my marriage. I knew Peggy was mostly at fault, but I couldn't take it out on her. Her lovers needed to face consequences for their actions. Freddie Springer, one of them, always made a stop at Mac Murray's for a drink before heading home. As dusk descended, he emerged from the bar's side door, making his way toward his car parked at the rear. Seizing the element of surprise, I grabbed his arm and twisted it behind his back, forcing him against the wall. The sickening sound of bones meeting brick filled the air as I maintained my hold, relentlessly assaulting his kidneys with my free fist. Despite his futile struggles, I kept him pinned, delivering blow after blow until the sickening pop of his shoulder dislocating echoed in the alley. With him sprawled on the cobblestones, I calmly walked away as a crowd ambled down the alley, their attention elsewhere. Unperturbed, I strolled to my car and drove off, unruffled by the absence of pursuit. Two hours later, I found myself at the police station, where Peggy had put up our house as collateral for my bail, dutifully completing the necessary paperwork. 
Alice Springer burst in, yelling that she wanted me locked up forever. They managed to keep her away from me, but she kept ranting until Peggy spoke to her. I'm not sure what Peggy said, but Alice glared at us both before storming out. Robert and Dave had my car and drove me home while Peggy followed behind. The boys looked proud of me, but I made sure not to encourage them. Freddy suffered a dislocated shoulder, a broken nose, two black eyes, and various internal injuries yet to be fully assessed. Several ribs were broken, but thankfully, none pierced his lungs. My wife and I didn't discuss the incident when we got home. I slept on the couch for the first time in 20 years, but it didn't bother me. The next morning, I was up early, trying to figure out my next move. The Osaka Maru was docking at Felixdale. Captain Jose Costa agreed to take me on if I sorted out my papers. I promised to get back to him later in the week. On my way home, I stopped to refuel. As I finished, I noticed someone rushing toward me. I turned just in time for Ray Collins to hit me on the left side with a 2x4. It grazed my left arm before cracking a couple of ribs. I struggled to breathe, feeling unable to take in air. With my eyes shut, I saw bright flashes of white and then felt my knees give out. The wooden club made a strange clunking noise as it bounced on the pavement. Ray lost his grip on it after the impact. As I fell, my right hand instinctively grabbed onto some flannel. Twisting to the left, I slammed my right fist with the flannel into the ground. I landed hard on top of Ray's body, with my eyes still tightly shut to block out the pain in my left side. My left arm felt immovable. My right hand began hammering up and down. I wasn't sure what I was hitting, as long as it wasn't the asphalt. Both sides of my body seemed to work independently. While my left side curled up for protection, my right side kept attacking anything it could find. At first, Ray wriggled beneath me, attempting to escape, but soon he lay still. I didn't stop hitting him until some bystanders pulled me off. Breathing was still difficult, and the pain was intense. A medic administered a shot, and I drifted off to sleep on the way to the hospital. When I woke a few hours later, my left arm was in a sling and my body was tightly taped. Breathing was easier, but still required caution. Peggy was there, looking displeased. What on earth were you doing, Grady? She exclaimed. You caused quite a scene over that little party issue. Sorry, honey, I replied. I didn't do anything. Why did your friend attack me with a 2x4? And what's this about a little party issue? I need a better explanation of what happened that said, I insisted, or I'll keep asking around. You weren't just asking. Peggy retorted. You were going after them and beating them up. I gave her a wry smile. Why would I want to do that? Stop acting like a bully and stop calling them my friends. Peggy left as the doctor entered. I was banged up more than anything serious. Ray swung like a kid in a playground. My arm was sore and my cracked ribs weren't too bad. The pain and trouble breathing were just from the hit. The next morning, Robert and Dave picked me up, grinning widely, but I told them to cool it. Ray, on the other hand, was in bad shape. He'd be on a liquid diet for a month with his jaw wired shut, and it'd take a week for his swollen face to go down. One punch did break his collarbone, though every punch was kinda random since I wasn't aiming. No charges were filed against me since witnesses confirmed Ray deed at first. I had to extend my time off, this round due to sick leave. Sally informed me that Bob Timbers had resigned, with his earnings redirected to his brothers in Aberdeen. Colin's whereabouts remained a mystery. Communication between Peggy and me had dwindled, resulting in me sleeping on the couch each night. Though I shed the arm slings soon after, my ribs still throbbed slightly, though movement and breathing were manageable. With the Osaka Maru scheduled to depart in four days, I met with my lawyer, finalizing divorce papers set to be served within the same time frame. And trusting everything to Peggy, including our home, didn't phase me, as I knew the bail bond company would seize it once I skipped bail. Appending my vasectomy paperwork and a recent material count lab report to the divorce documents, I reached out to friends in Scotland and resumed gym sessions to recover from the 2x4 attack. Henry Clark, reluctant to see me go, pledged discretion and agreed to keep an eye on my boys if necessary. Meanwhile, Peggy's gym visits ceased and the household descended into disarray, mounting laundry. And a general state of disorder overwhelmed the home, with hurriedly prepared meals and lackluster conversations becoming routine. It appeared Peggy was regaining weight, marking the onset of a rapid decline that unfolded over just four weeks. The next day, the boys handed me my maritime papers, thrilled. We were all eager to go. I told them to finish the school year before making any decisions, but I'm not sure they heard me. I sorted out everything I needed on the Osaka Maru and got a list from the quartermaster for the next morning's sale. One last time, Robert had left his motorcycle parked at the dock's end. It was an uncomfortable eight-hour ride to Aberdeen. 
The motorcycle was shaking so much I couldn't even see the odometer. Despite the smooth engine and decent weather, I was relieved when I finally arrived. My friends found Bob Timbers and arranged to meet at the Four Crowns. The men's room was in the back, accessed from outside. I briefly checked inside to signal my arrival to my friends, then waited outside the building. The first two guys were locals, but then Bob came out. I heard the door lock behind him as he headed toward the restroom. I grabbed his right arm, like I did with Freddy, and pressed his head against the stone wall as we moved down the alley. His face scraped against the stone as he stumbled along. I walked about 50 feet and leaned him against the wall. He was groaning and crying in pain. In the dim street light, I could see his right eye socket was covered in blood. His cheekbone was visible below his eye, and the whole side of his face was scraped raw. Please don't end me, Grady. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He pleaded. I had no plans to end him, but I saw no reason to tell him that. Here's the deal, Bob. Tell me the truth about what happened at the party and you'll live. Lie to me and you're done for. Okay, okay, I'm hurting, Grady, he whimpered. Talk, and I'll get you a doctor, I promised. When Peggy showed up at the party without you, Colin got excited. He bragged about how he was going to get her drunk and sleep with her. Peggy looked great, Grady, really. She was dressed up and seemed like she was up for a good time. Colin kept giving her drinks, saying we could have sloppy seconds. We didn't think he could pull it off. After a while he took her to the storeroom and we followed. You sure you want to hear this, Grady? Yes. Keep going, I said firmly. Okay, but please don't hurt me anymore, Bob pleaded. We could hear Colin and Peggy behind the door getting busy. She was moaning and saying dirty things like in those adult movies. It got us all worked up just listening. Eventually, Colin opened the door. Peggy was on the couch with one knee up, her private area exposed. Her top was down, her breasts out, and she had a big grin on her face. We each took turns with her, and she even gave BJ. We never harmed her, Grady. We never made her do anything she didn't want to do. Colin and Freddy had closeness with her, but Ray and I weren't interested in that. After we finished, we helped her get dressed. She and Colin left together and I think they went somewhere before he dropped her off, but I'm not sure. I'm really sorry, Grady. We didn't hurt her, I swear. And we didn't force her to do anything she didn't want to do. He pleaded. I just stared at him. Do you know where Colin Farrell is? He shook his head no. This guy couldn't afford to lie to me. His story matched Sally's more closely than Peggy's. His face looked awful in the dim light. He was bleeding more and his eye socket was turning black. Pieces of skin were hanging from his cheek, and the exposed flesh beneath was bright red. I knocked on the pub's locked door, said goodbye to some old friends, and hopped on the bike. A few miles down the road, I saw an ambulance heading toward the pub. It was early morning when I parked the motorcycle where I'd found it and boarded the Osaka Maru. Robert would pick up the bike later. My first shift was that night, so I spent the rest of the day recovering from my trip. That motorcycle really did a number on me. I should have taken the car. Several hours later, I woke up, showered, and grabbed some dinner. My supervisor briefed me on my job duties and left me to it. It was an entry-level position, not too difficult. My co-workers weren't very friendly or helpful. They'd answer direct questions, but offered no guidance, and none seemed interested in making connections. I hoped to bond with the crew, but it seemed unlikely. Everyone appeared to be friendly with each other, but I felt left out. I decided to be patient and waited out. Peggy should have received her divorce papers that morning, and I'm sure Bob Timbers has shared his side of the story with the authorities by now. Mr. Baxter, the Royal Navy has requested authorization to land a helicopter on the Osaka Maru to transport you back to the mainland, he announced gravely. I received a detailed wire this morning outlining the justification for their request. Allow me to summarize some of the key points in the extradition appeal. Should there be any inaccuracies, you'll have the opportunity to provide clarification. They wish to speak with you regarding the disappearance of an individual named Colin Farrell. You're facing charges related to Colin Farrell's disappearance. You're also accused of severely beating a man named Fred Springer, causing him to lose one kidney and possibly the other. You skipped bail on that charge. You're charged with injuring a man named Ray Collins, initially listed as self-defense, but now considered more severe. Lastly, on the night you boarded the ship, you allegedly beat a man named Bob Timbers in Aberdeen so badly that he lost his transportation. I don't know how you could have been in Aberdeen at the same time. And I don't want to know. It's stated here that all these incidents were carried out with your bare hands as retribution for a personal offense. Mr. Baxter, do you have any comments? Sir, I apologize for any trouble I may have caused, specifically regarding the charges. I just wish I could have found Colin Farrell. He would have been in the hospital like the other three. 
I have no idea where that guy is. I'll pack up my things and be ready for the helicopter when it arrives. Captain Costa smiled at me and said, that won't be necessary. I told them you never boarded. There's no Grady Baxter on the Osaka Maru. Now get back to work. I returned to the crew quarters, showered, and prepared for my shift. By dinner, the police report had spread throughout the entire crew. For the rest of the trip, I had more friends than I could handle. I didn't hear from anyone back home until about a month later. My lawyer sent me a wire informing me that the divorce was finalized, so I was officially a free man. Peggy received the same news. However, she lost the house to the bail bond company when I left the country. Colin Farrell ended up in the hospital with serious injuries, and the police were looking for Robert and Dave regarding the incident. My sons discovered Colin with Peggy in our bedroom before the house was reclaimed. Peggy was now living in Oslo with her sister, expecting a child and facing weight issues again. I still had pending charges, and my lawyer advised against returning. He had no information on the whereabouts of my sons. The news left me with mixed feelings. The next morning at breakfast, the captain approached our table and said, I just wanted to let you know that Robert and Dave Baxter aren't aboard the Tanakamara headed for Cape Town. We both smiled. I always dreamed of a life at sea. Second story. How do I forgive myself for being the other woman? How do I forgive myself for being the other woman? Last year, I went to live with a friend that my father has known for 15 years. This was my first time meeting her but she is sweet lady who I consider to be a second mom. Upon moving there I was very depressed and suicidal, dealing with anxiety, low self-esteem, and loneliness. She, my father, and her family had been trying to help me improve my mental state so I could feel less alone. One of her kids is 41 years old. He is the player type, charming and attractive. I told her he was handsome. She laughed and later on told him this innocently. Old lady moment I guess. He dropped me off at work one time, and I saw him here and there when he'd come by the house. Then I saw him at a barbecue, where he introduced his family and I to his girlfriend of three years. About a week after the barbecue, he suggested that him and I go bowling. When I asked who else was going, he said it would be just us. I asked the mother for her opinion as I wasn't sure if intentions were pure or not. She told me he was likely up to no good and that I shouldn't go. I texted him that it would be inappropriate due to the age difference and his girlfriend. Shortly after, the mother changed her mind, saying she was overthinking it and he was probably just trying to do a kind thing and help cheer me up, like the rest of their family was. So we went. I purposely dressed down since I didn't want him to think I was interested in anything other than bowling. After two games we sat down and he told me that I'm a grown woman capable of making my own choices, and that we should spend time together regardless of his mother's opinion. We then played pool at a bar and he asked me to come back to his place. I agreed and after talking for a long time he started touching me. We kissed and I told him I didn't want to take off my pants, but he proceeded to do so anyways, and was very adamant about giving me oral. The next morning, he took me to get breakfast and a manicure, and then ate me out once again. Part of me enjoyed it and craved more. Part of me felt violated. Part part of me felt guilty for going behind his girlfriend's back. He texted me a few days later saying he had a gift for me and that he wanted us to go to the beach. I told him what we were doing was wrong, to which he answered, Stop overthinking the situation. You are grown and in control. I'd like to think that this is a positive interaction that will only turn negative if one of us allows it. I told him I wanted to continue oral sex but I didn't want intercourse. He was upset by this but he ate me out once more. Then he did a really mean thing, set up plans for me to come over, had me get ready and wait until 10pm, when really he was out with his friends the whole time. This was his revenge for me not agreeing to have sex with him. When I realized he was playing a game, I broke down crying. I felt rejected and used and my suicidal thoughts increased. The reason I went along with this is because as someone who has grown up feeling ugly her whole life, I genuinely thought that he was the best I could do and that I had to savor the moment, event if it meant hurting his girlfriend. I wanted the chance to feel desirable for once and I craved to be touched. I am not trying to make myself the victim here, just giving my thought process throughout it. His girlfriend is the one who is. How do I move on and forgive myself? I am trapped in a shame spiral, with guilt and shattered self-worth. I hate that I allowed myself to be a side piece and I'm struggling to move forward. It's been six months, by the way. Third story. He cheated, got an incurable STD from someone, and then gave that STD to another person he cheated on me with. I was with him for four years and I found out that he was cheating on me with multiple women. Then I found how that he now has an incurable STD, and then was seeing another woman and gave her that same STD. Luckily I did not get anything, but the other woman is not aware of him cheating or anything at all. 
So now they both have genital herpes or I guess they are trying to make it work since they both have it. And on top of that the girl has diabetes and HPV from what he told me. I have been dying to tell this woman what this man has done and how he cheated on me with her. And then basically cheated on her with me. I am not sure how to go about this. Karma really got him. But Ike if I should just let this go and move on with my life or should I tell her that he was unfaithful to me and cheated on me while he was seeing her. Now they both have this STD. And I feel like even if I tell her it's going to damage her more since she now has so many diseases and issues. So Ike if I should just walk away and let God handle this or if I should tell her that he was with me for three years and cheated on me with multiple women until he got with her and infected her. Please help I've had so much anxiety because of this and don't know what to do. Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional rollercoaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.